All right, so hi everyone. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. Um, super excited. It's not only my first time doing something like this. I've never actually ever been on a Zoom call before. So considering all things that have been going on the last year, um, it's, a, it's a maybe a weird thing to say. But I'm hoping everyone sort of thought forward and has a pot of water ready to go for cooking our pasta. Um, if you don't, you've got a short amount of time to do that. I'm going to click my pot on. And yeah, it's coming to temperature nicely, actually. And one of the things that's really important when you're cooking pasta is to have your, your water salted. Um, there's an old saying that uh, you want, it's salty like tears. I'm not sure who tasted tears and decided that was the right flavor they were going for, but it does work. So I've got a pot of water on the stove over here, and I'm gonna add a, a good hefty amount of salt to that. I also have a smaller pot on the go that we're gonna be using to poach the raspberry, or sorry, the uh, rhubarb for our salad dressing. So if you could all get those two things going and hopefully maybe you already do, that'd be super. There was one other um, maybe specialized piece of equipment I could have mentioned, but everyone's gonna need a dish sort of similar to this. Um, glass or stainless steel doesn't matter as long as it um, will fit in your freezer and it's obviously safe to go in your freezer. So I have, this is the dish that I have for today. When it comes to preparing a meal, especially a three course meal like this, one of the really important things to know is in which order you're gonna do things. Um, a lot of people sort of get overwhelmed or confused and they maybe do things out of step and by the time you, you know, you're ready to put your, your pasta dish together, your noodles are overcooked or undercooked or cold or what have you. So it's something that uh, it's not really easy to explain in a situation like this, but it's that timing process that is, is kind of a key to, to putting together a quick and easy meal. Um, so we'll start with dessert, which sounds maybe a little counterintuitive, but because that is the dish that is going to take the longest amount of time to produce today, that's what we're gonna start with. Really, all you wanna do, I'm sorry if, uh, I'm assuming we've got a good shot of this. It's quick and easy to just take the greens off your strawberries. There's a lot of people that like to pop the core out through the bottom and whatnot. I don't find that's really necessary. Um, it maybe makes them look a little bit prettier, but, uh, whoa, that one got away. At the end of this dish, well, you'll see, it's not really gonna matter. So I'm just quickly taking the tops off these, like so. And depending on your blender, you might want to quarter them or half them. Um, it's probably not a bad idea for some of the bigger strawberries. So we'll go like that. Um, so I've almost got these strawberries ready to go. And what we're going to be doing here, again, it's a really simple preparation. Um, we're just going to pop them in our blender. And not, I've actually not used this blender before, but uh, it's an Oster. It'll work just fine. And I have my blender set to liquefy. Exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah. Beautiful. I'm just gonna give this a quick taste. I know I added probably about two tablespoons of honey. And I would say that's perfectly sweet for my taste. And that now all we're gonna do is pour that into this glass container. Doesn't matter if there's still a couple of chunks. Try and make sure it's somewhat even, which should happen naturally. And we're just gonna pop it into the freezer. So I've tested this recipe and it takes about an hour for it to freeze properly to the consistency that we want it to be.
And I'm assuming by the time we're done our other two dishes and everyone's eaten, they'll be ready for dessert. Now I did set, set one up earlier, so I'll be able to show you the presentation on the dessert, even though my sorbet might not be perfectly ready to go. So, my water still hasn't come to a boil yet. And once it does, we'll move into the next step, but I'll talk to you about a couple of things uh, before we go into that. So when Tracy first uh, approached me about this idea, I had everyone, uh, or I asked her to have people submit ideas of things that they wanted to cook. And there were, qu there were quite a few really great ideas actually. Um, pasta came up a lot, specifically shrimp, so I did go in that route. Um, and then I thought I kind of wanted to create a little bit of a theme and you know we're just a few days away from the the official beginning of summer so i was like let's just go summer it's a very simple concept and it can encompass a lot of things so that's the theme i chose and that's why we've got uh you know we're using the strawberries which are are fresh and local like i said um we've got the rhubarb and the spinach involved and i don't um Outside of my work at the restaurant, I'm, I'm quite an avid gardener as well, and I know that rhubarb and spinach are always some of the first things that come out of my garden in the spring into the summer. So I love to use those ingredients as much as I can. Um, and then we've got the pasta, and, and I think you might have noticed that in that pasta dish, there's, there's crushed chilies, which are going to bring a fair bit of heat to that dish. Um, and what a lot of people don't know or don't think about, I guess I should say, um, is that eating a spicy dish on a hot day will actually cool you down and it's, and it's something that's really sort of beneficial for a lot of reasons. But once you've eaten something spicy and it's, it's actually increased your inter internal body temperature, you're gonna be more acclim acclimatized to the external temperature. So a nice spicy pasta dish like that on a summer day, it's really, really great. So, How's everyone's water doing? Because I'd like to get into the next step, which is going to be uh, quickly getting our salad dressing started. Well, I'm just going to do it. Um, hopefully you've all found some rhubarb. I did say fresh or frozen, which is totally fine. Either will work for you. I'm assuming a frozen product came already chopped. Um, fresh product, really all you need to do is give it a quick chop like that. It doesn't need to look pretty. All right, so I've, I've chopped my, uh, my rhubarb, like I said, just roughly, and I'm just gonna pop that into the smaller pot of water that I have going, and it's gonna wanna sit there for about 10 minutes. Um, we're just softening it up. We're gonna brighten up some of the flavors that are in there, and it uh, should be quite nice when, once it's ready to go. So I put together a really, really simple salad today that's just got our dressing, our spinach, some red onion, and the chevre trees and all of those ingredients can be altered plate to plate so if you have somebody that doesn't like onion we'll just leave that off their dish or if you have somebody that might want say some tomato with their salad well you can add some to some tomato to their dish it's really an, a great way to still feed everybody simply um, but appease all those different tastes that you have in your house so We'll start with just, oh, actually I want this half, this onion. For some reason I could only find gigantic red onions. And we certainly won't need all of this. And I find, especially with a salad dish and something really overpowering in flavor like an onion, the thinner you can slice it, the better. So a nice sharp blade, even though it seems a little scary, is actually the safer way to go. So what I like to do with onions you could slice them with this way, that way, but I like to just start at one end and just slowly, well, this is slow for me anyway, um, just sort of push my knife forward through the onion. You can kind of see that I'm holding my hand like this. Oh, maybe you can't. <laughs> um, keeping the tips of my finger really far away from the edge of my knife. Getting in there and getting as thin as I possibly can. Now these ingredients list that I sent you guys, it was sort of based on the idea that you'd be cooking for two. Um, maybe that was an oversight, my apologies. But we'll move forward. 
if you need to increase or decrease the amount, um, that's fine. Or have leftovers, that's also really fine. All right, so we've sliced this onion nice and thin. I'm gonna set this just to the side of my board because really the next steps are ridiculously easy. Before we go on to them though, I'm just gonna take a quick, oh, my pasta water is boiling now too. Is everyone else's pasta water boiling? Yeah, I don't care. Um, we're using linguine this evening, so we're gonna get that cooking right away. Linguine generally takes about eight minutes to cook to a nice al dente. As you can see, I'm not exactly measuring this, um, but I'm estimating that that's about what two people would eat. It's a half of a 180 gram bag, I believe. Um, and that's just gonna go straight into my water. Gonna give it a quick little spin and then let it do its thing. It's important with a long noodle like linguine that you do stir it occasionally throughout the cooking process because you don't want it to clump together. But if you've given yourself a, a big enough pot, um, it should have plenty of room to move around in there once it gets boiling again. All right, so that's happening now, and we'll move on to the next step of our salad, which is really just gonna be picking through our spinach leaves. Baby spinach is a really nice uh, product. You can get other more mature spinaches and whatnot, but baby spinach is really delicate and generally doesn't need to be cleaned at all. Um, I mean, if you're picking it fresh from your garden, sure, you're gonna want to make sure there's no dirt or whatnot on it, but store-bought stuff is, is usually really great. Um, so what I like to do is just quickly sort of run through it and I'll pull out any leaves that may have wilted a little bit or have blemishes on them that I don't particularly want. I'm going to add my onion. And again, I probably won't use all the amount that I sliced there based on how much spinach I chose. And I'm gonna set that aside up here. And we're gonna get our dressing put together. It's been just about 10 minutes since I started my rhubarb. So I'm gonna take this pot. And really, you know what? You'll see a slight pink color to your water. I don't know, we can pick that up. And that just means it's been doing its job. So I'm just gonna step over to the, my sink here and drain this real quickly. that back into my pot. So I didn't need to take all, you know, like there's still a little bit of water, still a little bit of liquid in my pan and that's fine. It's not gonna make too much difference to the end product. And we're gonna try, yeah, sorry, if you wanna take a look at that. It's nice and soft, a little bit of liquid. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm gonna get my rhubarb in there. I'm gonna take a quick second and stir my pasta. It's coming along nicely. And we'll go back to our dressing. So, I do wanna reference this recipe. I like to, um, I like to cook from feel and sort of eyeball the ingredients, but when it comes to making a salad dressing, you do kind of want to stick to the, the, the recipe just because there's a classic ratio and it really comes down to the, the vinegar to oil ratio when you're making a, a salad dressing. Uh, too much oil and it'll be mommy and flavorless. Too much vinegar and it'll just shoot you in the face and you might not enjoy it just as much. In recent years, there's been a big culinary trend where that classic ratio has changed uh, from, used to be a three to one ratio uh, to a two to one. So two parts oil to, to uh, one part vinegar. And I love that. I think that's a perfect mix. Um, if you look back at old French recipes, 
um, it'll be a, a different ratio, but they were wrong. We know better now. <laughs> so I'm going to pop that back onto my blender base. I've got my rhubarb in there so far. And we're going to start with, where did I put my measuring spoons? Oh, right in front of me. Um, we're going to start with the Dijon mustard. So I'm going to pop that in. Dijon does a magical thing when you're mixing oil and other liquids together. Dijon really helps do what is called emulsification. And that's just where you're, you're basically tricking the, the fat and the, and the water com components to combine. And we know that, you know, oil and water don't generally mix. Uh, but there's certain ingredients like mustard and egg yolk, which we're not using today, that'll help the oils, the oil and the liquid combine and give you a creamier texture. Um, so that's why Dijon's important. It also tastes really good too. So set that aside for now. Oh, and quickly stir my pasta. I'll show you when my, when my noodles are getting closer, I'll show you something, um, a really nice little trick that I like to use. Uh, it's not a trick at all. It's just, um, a, a way to know when your noodles are done as opposed to throwing them at the wall, which does work, but it's really not ideal. Um, so we'll go on to our vinegar component next. Almost any vinegar will work in this recipe. I wouldn't use a, a straight white vinegar, too overpowering, but red wine vinegar, apple cider vinegar, rice wine vinegar are all beautiful for salad dressing. So <laughs> this is the one I'm using today. Um, and our quantity for that is two tablespoons. So I'm just gonna pour that out. into there. Put the lid back on. Uh, I have on your recipe salt and pepper to taste. I'm gonna just add a quick pinch of salt and a quick grind of pepper because I know I'm gonna need it. I might add a little bit more in a second or two. So those ingredients are all in there. I'm going to pop the lid back on my blender. My blender has, the blender I'm using today has this cap that pops out. If you have that, take that part out. It's going to make this next step a little, a little bit easier. And I'm going to measure out my quarter cup of olive oil. I brought this olive oil from the restaurant and at the restaurant it comes in a gigantic can and I didn't want to carry that around with me, so I got this little jar that you probably can't see because my blender's in the way. All right, but I have my quarter cup measured out here. I've got my lid here. It's probably a good idea since I have that top open to just cover it quickly with a cloth. Oops, spilled my chili. Make sure my, I have my blender on a lower setting and I'm just gonna click her on. And everything's buzzing up nicely in there now. Looks good. And just, if everyone's ready or is able to watch, I'm going to start to slowly add my oil. Whoa. Let it go for another second or two. Shut it off. You know, oh, I did grab one. So, as I pour this out, everyone should be able to see that it does have this nice, creamy, almost mayonnaise-like texture. And that's a result of the emulsification that I was talking about earlier. Um, If you make too much of this and you want to store it in your fridge, it will literally last for, you know, weeks if you don't eat it all, of course. Um, but you might see it separate out a little bit. That's fine. Just give it a little shake and it'll come back together well enough. Um, and still taste delicious. The vinegar will preserve it for quite a long time. So again, we're just going to give it a quick taste. That's not a bad idea. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna dissuade anyone from doing that. Well, my pasta 
is probably bang on as well. So I don't know how, how mu much we can zoom in here, but if you look right on the tail end of this pasta, this piece of pasta, you should see a little spot of white anyway, and that's where the noodle is actually still a little bit raw in the center, and that's what's gonna give you um, the texture we're looking for, which is, you know, you hear the word al dente, it means uh, with bite or with tooth, and it just means that you're gonna have a little bit of chew left in your noodle. You don't want it to just turn to mush in your mouth. All right, so we're gonna give that a second to, uh, to drain. And I'll mention uh, one thing that I think is a mistake that a lot of people make when they're cooking pasta. Once they've once it's cooked and they they've drained it, a lot of people uh, like to run cold water over their noodles, and that's just you know to kind of stop the cooking process. If you haven't gotten it to the point to that al dente point, you might want to stop that cooking process as quickly as possible. But honestly, what happens when you do that is you're washing away a lot of the starches that are on the noodle. Um, and that will affect the texture of your sauce at the end of the day. So I really like to just let uh, pasta air cool. Um, I will sometimes maybe lay it out on a tray and, and stick it in the refrigerator if I'm concerned about it, um, it, it continuing to cook as it cools. Um, but for the most part, if you let it sit out, it'll be just fine. So just give me one more second and I'm going to... Okay. All right. So actually let's finish, no, let's do this real fast. So I've drained my pasta and I've poured it into another bowl and I'm just going to give it another little quick shot of olive oil and give it a quick toss and that way the noodles, that'll prevent the noodles from sticking to each other. Um, Again, that's just a textural thing. You don't want a, a big glommy mouthful of noodles. And I'm gonna set that aside for now. And we'll get back to that guy. So yeah, the poppy seeds in the, in the, in the dressing, I'm sorry I forgot about that. Um, really what you need to do is just sort of sprinkle them across the top of your dressing um, and stir them in. And they're gonna add some texture and a little bit of flavor. Yeah, so uh, sorry, that was the poppy seed component of that. So really our salad now is all ready to plate. Um, so you know what, we might as well do that. Again, this is sort of a personal taste thing. I don't like a dressing, or a salad rather, that's swimming in dressing. I like just a nice little coating. So I'm only going to probably use for the amount of, of leaves I have here about, that was about three teaspoons I just put in there. And we'll set that aside. And we'll just give her a nice little toss. Again, baby spinach being the delicate leaf that it is, you don't need to go absolutely crazy with it. And I think that looks pretty well coated to my taste, but again, if you feel like you need to, add some more dressing. Add less dressing and then we're gonna just take that you know at the restaurant presentation is uh, is super super important and it's something we spend a lot of time on but my personal opinion is that uh, you know a rustic look sometimes when you just throw something on a plate it actually ends up looking a lot more attractive than when you you try and uh, arrange it and there's there's something I don't like about these chefs that get right down and, and micro present every plate that they have. So nice, quick, little rustic look like that. And then I'll reach for my cheese. This is a, a ripened chevre cheese. I don't know if everyone's familiar with goat cheese. Um, it's not feta. It's a completely different beast altogether. And in fact, most feta cheeses aren't uh, made from goat's milk. Um, but I, I, I feel like sometimes people confuse the two things. So this is quite different. It's a, it's a soft cheese um, and it's got a it's wonderful grassy flavor that again is very reminiscent of summer. Um, it, and I hope everyone enjoys it. And again, if this is something that you think a member of your family might not like, well then, you know, a little bit of feta would work just fine. A little bit of Parmesan would work just fine. 
So mine came in, in a tube sort of like this. So I'm just gonna cut off uh, uh, what I feel is an appropriate amount and, and just sort of using my thumb, flick it and crumble it and break it onto the top of my salad. Nice big pieces like that. Like so. And then just for fun and because we can, I'll give it another little pinch of the poppy seeds. Give it some color, a little bit more texture, and we'll set that aside. And we're going to call that a completed dish. So if any, anyone can't wait, although you still have a bit more work to do, crumble that there. And crumble that there. I think that looks nice. And again, like I said before, you want to throw some red peppers in there, some tomatoes, go right ahead. Anything that, uh, that you think you might want to add. A little shredded carrot. You know, the world's your oyster. Um, just because, you know, a chef tells you that these are the things that should be in that salad doesn't matter. It, it's what you want. It's what you want to add. And that's what's going to, you know, make your family more appeased with your culinary adventures, I guess you could say. So, really the only thing we have left to do is put our pasta together and it's gonna take a little bit of work. So, we'll start with the garlic. I did ask uh, in the ingredients, or I did mention in the ingredients uh, to have your garlic minced. Of course, I didn't bother to mince my garlic because I'm just gonna quickly take care of that myself. I know you can buy a store-bought uh, minced garlic, and that, that product is generally quite fine. Um, I personally, you know, don't mind chopping garlic, so I'll just take care of that myself. And again, it's not, there's no real special skill to this, and there's no need for it to be 100% precise, or every little piece to be exactly the, you know, the same size. It's just, you know, you don't want a whole clove of garlic. So you're going to chop it up. And what we're doing here for our pasta dish is we're creating what's called a mise en place. So that's a real bastardized French term that just quite means uh, stuff in place. So you're going to want all of your ingredients for your pasta set up and in their place. Because when you're building a dish like a pasta, you are literally building layers of flavor. Um, and so you want those flavors to go into your pan in a specific order at a specific time. And if you're not ready with something prepared and in its place, your building might fail. Although again, if you're just cooking for yourself and a couple of family members, you shouldn't feel any pressure. Well, I don't know your families. Um, so I've got my garlic chopped there, and then I'm going to go with my cherry tomatoes. Cherry tomatoes are another thing that I really think of as being a summery um, type thing. Tomatoes generally don't ripen until much later in the summer, but cherry tomatoes are often the very first that do start to ripen. So I, I love to use them and I'll start using them early in the summer and as soon as they're they're coming off the plants. Um, like I mentioned, I, we do a fair bit of gardening at my house and we actually haven't even got our tomatoes in the ground yet. So I feel a little bit strange telling you to use tomatoes, but that's what we're doing today. Um, it's been a busy week, okay? Uh, so take your tomatoes and you can just Cut them in half, see if I can get down. I like to cut them lengthwise so the, the little stem part was here on my left um, and you should be able to see the cross section of the tomato there. Um, these are really nice. I did just buy these from a grocery store but they're super, super juicy and bright red and fresh looking and I love that. So we're gonna just run through this pint of tomatoes real fast. There's our tomatoes, all set up and ready to go. I'm gonna push them to the side just so we can get a shot of this next process. And that's gonna be going into our, our green onions. 
Um, again, green onion, uh, spring onions are, are one of the first things that come up locally. And uh, they're just, I love to use products like this because you're gonna get a beautiful onion flavor out of this, but not that, oh my God, my breath smells onion flavor. Um, and the punch of color that it can add to a dish is just fantastic. So um, it's really ultimately not important how you cut this onion. Um, but what I like to do is take the, the, the root end off, like you may have just seen, and then find a space where the two, where these two ends sort of split so you can kind of get down the middle and just run your knife from that spot straight down. So you've cut your onion in half lengthwise. And then take that half and on a, a nice biased angle, I'd say that's probably about 45 or 30 percent angle that I've got there. So that I'm getting thin but long strips of that. All right. That's the beginning of my mise en place. The next thing we're gonna wanna do is reach for our butter. I called for a one eighth of a pound. Um, I'm not gonna measure that. In this dish, the amount of butter we're using doesn't, you know, it doesn't need to be accurate, but if you were doing some baking, if you were trying to make croissants or something and you were off by a tablespoon, well, you're not gonna enjoy your croissants that much. So I'm just gonna eyeball about an eighth of a cup. I'm gonna cut that chunk off. I'm gonna set it there with the rest of my mise en place. Stick this back away. And we're gonna grab a saute pan. All right, so I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get a good size saute pan. It's about that size um, on medium high heat. So I'm using an electric stove here and I have it set at about eight. Um, we don't want high heat cause that'll burn our butter. Uh, we don't want it too slow or our, or our cooking process is gonna take too long. So we've got, oh, we're missing a couple parts of our mise en place. I also have um, our Parmesan. And then of course our shrimp. So I'll, I'll bore you about this shrimp right now. So this is, um, it's a wild caught Argentinian shrimp, pink shrimp it's called. And you can see by the color that it, it's, it's pink, but it's raw. And that's unusual because usually you'll buy a white shrimp or sometimes a blue shrimp. And as it cooks, it, it picks up this pinkish red color. This shrimp for whatever reasons, I'm assuming because of its diet, um, comes pink like this. Um, as you cook it, it will become a little bit more vibrant. But the reason I love this shrimp so much is actually the flavor. I've never tasted a wild caught shrimp like this that has so much incredible sweetness, a great texture. And this is, uh, you know, this is available at most grocery stores. I got this from the Metro. So, you know, it's out there to look in the freezer section, Argentinian pink shrimp. Um, it's just a really great product. Uh, I would like to be able to buy, you know, there is a local shrimp farm in St. Thomas and they produce uh, an amazing product as well. Um, but it's 500 times the price of this. So it's just not worth it in my opinion. So I did say peeled and deveined, but you'll see that I left the tails on my shrimp. I did that just, uh, for presentation purposes. In honesty, it's kind of a pain in the butt when you're eating a pasta with the tail on or a, a pasta with shrimp. What am I missing here? I've got my noodles over there. Well, that's about it. Oh, we're gonna add a little bit more olive oil. So hopefully everybody's got a bit more olive oil. And the chili flakes. Yeah. And the chili flakes will come in and the Prosecco will come in a little bit later. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by just uh, adding my butter into my pan. And oh yeah, my pan's nice and, and hot now, not too hot. And I'm gonna give that a swirl. I know this looks like a ridiculous amount of butter and that's because it is. Um, but it's really creating the, it's really creating the, the main body of our sauce. Um, As my cousin who was a chef always said, 
says, fat makes stuff taste good. Fat does make stuff taste good. There's actual science that can prove that. Um, but who needs science? It's true. So we got our butter in there and it's melting quite nicely. We're going to add just a, another maybe say one ounce or a half ounce of olive oil. Um, and that is to, uh, that'll mix with the, with the butter fat and actually prevent the butter from burning as easily as it might if I wasn't paying attention to it. So we got a good shot of that pan going. That's great. Um, yeah, here, we'll move that next down. Um, and you can just give it a good swirl like that until your butter's nicely melted. And we're going to add whoop, our garlic at this point. That garlic should cook up nicely. Its flavors are going to infuse into that butter and that oil combination. I'm actually going to, I'm going to increase my temperature just a little bit because as I added those ingredients, obviously my pan cooled down a fair bit. So we're going to get that going. Once that butter's fully melted, we're going to incorporate our shrimp. So Tracy had a really good question at one point, how many shrimp per person? That's, that depends. That really depends on what uh, your personal tastes are. I'm, I love shrimp. I'm feeling like I'm gonna be hungry after this. So I've got, I got 12 shrimp in there too. Um, yeah, yep. Oh, I'm muted? Oh, well, I wasn't saying anything important anyway. There we go, sorry Mike. Are we good now? Okay, good. So all I did was I added my shrimp to this pan and we're going to let that cook for a little bit. I've got my temperature back up to, um, I said I had it at eight earlier. I've set it now to nine. So just a touch under the highest heat. And we're just going to let that cook for a bit. Um, Pastas, almost every dish, you'll always need to add some sort of seasoning to, um, like, you know, salt, pepper. In this case, we're going to be using chili, both those and chili flakes. Um, but I find it's really important, especially when you're cooking seafood, not to add your salt too early because it will, it tends to uh, draw the moisture out of your protein and it'll, it'll dry it out and it'll make it chewier, chewier and really that's, that's not something that you want. So... You can see as I as I turn these shrimp, they are picking up a much brighter red than they were before. You should find the same with whatever shrimp you're using that they'll they'll start to change color really quickly. Well, you're about to see why I work in the kitchen and not behind the bar. Oh, actually. I'm surprised how easily that went. I was for sure thought we were going to be mopping this floor after I was done. So normally if I was making this dish at the restaurant, I wouldn't use a Prosecco. I might just use a regular um, uh, non-sparkling wine, white wine. Um, but since we're also going to be using this in our dessert, I thought why not add it to the, to the pasta dish. Um, there's a couple reasons why um, we use alcohol in for culinary purposes um, and it really comes down to the, the way we perceive taste and the difference between taste and flavor so you're familiar with it you know the 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 taste of scent you're bitter salty spicy etc etc that those are tastes and you're perceiving all of that through your mouth but flavor you actually perceive through your nose and through your your sinus um, and there's a components in alcohol, especially when they've been cooked slightly, that will open up those receptors in your nose and you're going to get a fuller flavor. 
Um, sometimes some people think that the stronger the alcohol, the stronger the alcohol content, the better that perception is uh, perceived. I'm not sure if that's entirely true or not, but I do guarantee that just a little splash of, of alcohol in almost any dish will, will enhance that flavor. All right, so my shrimp are looking nice and cooked. You can see they're starting to pick up some color. All right, so my garlic is starting to toast now. I can see some caramelized sort of colors coming in there. My shrimp are cooking nicely. So we're gonna go with my next step, which is gonna be adding these tomatoes. All right, so at this point too, I'm also gonna turn my heat up a little bit, because again, those tomatoes will have cooled down the pan. And we want them to um, start releasing some of their liquid into the sauce. And that's what's really gonna help this whole dish come together. Yeah, so that's cooking along nicely. So let's go, at this point we can add the chili flakes. All right, so again, this is sort of just a to taste thing. I do want this, for my personal taste, I want this dish to have a nice bit of heat to it. Uh, so I would say in total what I just added there was about a teaspoon, um, which maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but when it comes to chili flakes, that's a lot. And we can just give that a little swirl, let them do their thing. There's something about that smell of roasting garlic that really... Uh, Stimulates the appetite, I guess you could say. So we're coming along nicely there. We don't want to cook these tomatoes until they start falling into mush. This isn't meant to be a tomato sauce. It's meant to, ha you know, the tomato is meant to be an ingredient. Um, but we're going to go right on to the next point and, and add our Prosecco. So it really just needs a splash. One of the other reasons that it's nice to add alcohol or something to your to your pasta dishes is it does what it's called deglazing, and it's a lot of the um, bits of garlic and whatnot that it might have stuck to this pan. This is going to create some steam and help those lift off the bottom of the pan and get back into your sauce. So we're just going to add a bit of a splash. Oh yeah, and so and there was somebody that asked for a non-alcoholic um, option here. Um, so I suggest a little bit of vegetable stock or shrimp stock, and that'll still create that deglazing effect. So that's a totally fine substitute. So we'll go in with that. And I want to, uh, at this point, just take a quick taste. Um, so yeah, we're gonna add our cheese in now. The liquid in my pan is, is boiling as you can see and so what I want is for this cheese to melt into that liquid and that's gonna give really nice body and flavor to, uh, to the sauce. So we're gonna add that in. Give it a little swirl around, maybe add a little bit more. Again, I'm not sure if I gave an exact ingredient or an exact uh, measurement on this. I think I said a, a quarter cup. Um, you know, this might sound a little bit ridiculous, but you're, you're almost looking for the consistency of, of the cheese sauce you get with a box of KD, right? Um, not liquid, not guami and gloopy. So I would say that's really good. That's the texture I'm looking for there. And I'm going to incorporate, go back to my noodles. And I'm just going to drop those in there. They're still slightly warm, um, but I could tell that they're not overcooked. And I'm going to give this a nice toss. And then again, you see how we're, I'm kind of moving a little bit quickly here now, and I, I hope not too quickly. So we're going to just, and that's why it was important to have our mise en place set up over here so that we could move this quickly. By the time we're done, our shrimp's gonna be nicely cooked, our pasta's gonna be nicely cooked. Well, you can see that our tomatoes are starting to break down. And now, 
we'll get to that last step and that's where the green onions go in. So you don't want to add these too early because they'll lose some of their crispness and they'll lose some of their color if you let them cook too long in the sauce. Um, and again, like I said before, that's one of the great things about them is that punch of color that they add, especially since we've got, you know, a lot of pinks and reds in there already. A little bit of green for contrast. Uh, basil would be really, really nice. Dill, of course, is a uh, is really common addition with seafood uh, dishes. And again, I'm gonna give it a little bit of a taste. Tasting your food as you go, I think, is really an important thing to do. And So yeah, my Parmesan, like I said, Parmesan is often um, salty, but I'm going to add just a little pinch. And again, that's just my personal preference. I'm going to give that enough, another little stir around. And I'm going to turn my heat off. And I'm going to, and I'm going to plate my pasta. Generally, a pasta like this isn't something that I would sit or let sit in a pot on the stove. It's something I want to have created and ready to plate when it's time to eat. So I hope everyone is pretty close and has been able to catch up a little bit. So I'm just going to, I don't know if you want bowls. I have to have these nice plates here that I thought would look great. And another, um, really important thing about pasta is that it's never it should never be soupy you know you, you don't want big puddles of, of sauce on the bottom of your plate you want your noodles nicely coated you want your ingredients ingredients nicely coated but you don't want them swimming swimming in sauce so we'll just make sure that we've caught that sort of evenly distributed. Oops. And a nice little bit of green up on the top. And then, of course, um, I love to finish pasta with another little sprinkle of our Parmesan cheese. All right, so those are our our first course, our first course, our second course, and the only thing left to do is hopefully plate up our third course, our little dessert cocktail. I have these champagne flutes. Um, it's really not important what to uh, serve this dish in. I just kind of like the looks of those. I'm just going to go over to the freezer. It's been in there for about 40 minutes. Yeah, and you can see mine is still a fairly liquidy, but it's really, really close to being ready. So the one thing with a with a sorbet like this, um, because all it is really is the strawberries and honey, if you leave it in there for too long, it's gonna be too solid to scoop out. But if that happens to you, you can take it out of the freezer, let it sit at room temperature until it hits a consistency that you can scoop properly. So I'm gonna check on the on the one that I made earlier today and hopefully it'll be in good shape for us. Yeah, so I just have a, a little a little ice cream scoop and I'm gonna take my sorbet and transfer it into my champagne flute, trying not to make too, too much of a mess. And even, you know, with that consistency, it's about the consistency of a, you know, a, a slush puppy. Um, it's still gonna taste really great. Um, and the, over here, I've got a little bit of fresh mint. Um, again, really sort of just for color, but the combination of mint and strawberry um, from a flavor standpoint is really, really kind of special. And all we're gonna do at this point is top this up with a bit of our sparkling wine. And if we really wanted to, we could put another little pinch of mint right on the top. Oh, maybe put a little bit more. That's just it. And again, strawberries, it's, it's all about summer. So, 
those are our three dishes for this evening. And uh, I'm done. <laughs> oh yeah, I was supposed to plug the church key more and I didn't. Church key. Oh yeah, and don't forget CCH. <laughs> don't you, you must remember the fight song, Tracy. I hear it every day. Yeah. Okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna say goodnight, and I'm glad everyone enjoyed, and maybe we'll see y'all soon in real life. <laughs> <laughs>